I'm going to be talking today about actually a couple of different research projects that we've been working on over the last several years, a few of which I think were specifically relevant to this landscape that we're in and the people that are here. I have actually um, taken out a lot of information on the Flathead National Forest that I, I could have left in here. I didn't know there'd be as many people here from such a broad range of geographies. Um, but just more to talk about later. I've only got 20 minutes and I tend to pack it in anyways. Um, I want to talk to you about um, two different projects that we've been working on over, this is work now we've been working on for about seven or so years in total. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is just portions of the work we've been working on in these two themes specifically. So what can we understand about the ecological dynamics and resilience mechanisms in what we call mixed energy fire regimes? Uh, I'm not going to talk too much in detail about about what that means. I'll show you what I think it means. There's a lot of discussions that we could have about that and some of the confusions around it. And the second is um, really understanding how changes in fire frequencies drive fundamental responses in these ecosystems. This is what we're faced with today. This is a lot about what we're going to be talking about today is how do we deal with when an ecosystem burns once, twice, three times, are there tipping points in these ecosystems? Are there vulnerabilities in these ecosystems? Or can they just repeatedly burn? What are the influences, um, or what are the factors that influence uh, how these ecosystems recover or function within that context? Um, and we're gonna be bringing data from a couple different ecosystems today to this conversation. Um, two projects in particular, so on, on the top in pink there is an area we've been working in in Alberta. Um, basically spanning a very large landscape between Watterson National Park right at the U.S. border and Banff National Park on the north. And then for my dissertation work, I worked uh, in part in the Yellowstone ecosystem, in the northern Yellowstone ecosystem range. And these are not the, these are not the exact same ecosystem as, as we're in today, as we're talking about today, as we're going to be looking at, which I've shown here in the green for the Rocky Mountain front. Um, but they're highly relevant. And the reason for that is because we are working in uh, systems with ex very parallel vegetation characteristics, right? A lot of the same forest types. Um, many of the forests that I've worked in are listed here. There's some forest types that I'm not going to be addressing today, but some of the major forest types are these lowland elevation, uh, Douglas fir forests, uh, trembling aspen that mixes in with them in lower elevations, um, lodgepole pine, which defines a lot of the ecology and the, and the area in many of these ecosystems, and then spruce fir forests are common to a lot of um, national forests and environments east of the continental divide. And those are the ones that we've been working in specifically. So I won't be presenting information that's specific to this landscape, but I think it's highly relevant. It's the same ecosystems, it's the same um, biosphere, it's just separated in some cases, for instance, by um, sort of arbitrary borders. Um, this is just to give you an overview of the ecosystems that we worked in in Yellowstone. I'm bringing that information in because we were focused specifically on these pure Douglas fir forests. There's, um, they really are essentially pure Douglas fir forests. A little bit of limber pine or juniper in some cases. Um, they tend to mix in with lodgepole at higher elevation types. But um, they represent about 30 to 35 percent of the Yellowstone ecosystems. They're actually an important part of that greater Yellowstone area. And you find them here on the Rocky Mountain front as well. Um, that's mainly the ecosystem that we worked in uh, for, for Yellowstone. And then within Alberta, we've been working in this montane forest, uh, the lower to middle elevation forest zones that are um, dominated predominantly by lodgepole pine and trembling aspen with Douglas fir in the southern portion of the range. Um, so slightly different forest types, a little bit of overlap in the pure Douglas fir <coughs> forest. Um, and these are the dominant forest types that define this landscape as well. So um, this is work that we felt would be highly relevant um, to this conversation here because we don't have this same kind of information source locally yet. That's one thing that they're actually quite interested in doing. Um, but this is, for now, sort of an analog. Just very briefly to talk about what we've done methodologically and, and uh, how we've been sampling this landscape and what the data is based on that I'm going to talk about for most of the rest of the talk. We've been installing networks of dendroecological plots throughout these landscapes, distributed as broadly as we can to capture biophysical gradients of interest, where we've been sampling fire scars and age structure data. So when did trees establish in response to, to fire? How many fires did trees of different species um, survive? And so on and so forth. And we've been combining this with aerial, detailed historical aerial photographic uh, 
um, reconstructions of the landscape conditions at the time. So we can nest these plots of ours within patches in the landscape that we can then map over much larger areas than we're able to do with um, within our ecological data historically. This is our spider bear drainage, by the way. And then we can take this approach and scale it up to very large landscapes as we um, map over larger and larger areas. So this is kind of the approach that we've been taking. Here's an example of it from Alberta. We've been working predominantly within this uh, Um, we've been working within the brown here, predominantly within this montane zone, um, and, and not focusing as much on the higher elevation forest, but we've been interested in these areas of higher fire frequency. And this is the kind of work we've done, defining these patches over broad areas uh, and important biophysical gradients, and then sampling within those to really get a robust understanding of the variability um, and, and of the fire regime and, and the dynamics <coughs> of these ecosystems. So a few um, brief results. What I'm going to be showing you in each of these graphics uh, follows a similar format. So these are dry mix conifer, ponderosa pine stands. Um, we actually don't have any of these. These are from the flathead. Um, dry mix conifer, Douglas fir forest. These were very dry uh, talus slopes, uh, sites dominated by Douglas fir. And these are just pure Douglas fir forest types. So this is the majority of what I'm going to be talking about today. The Yellowstone work is in this pure, dry Douglas fir forest type. Um, and then within Alberta, quite a diverse array of forest types that all intermix over very short distances, um, including some of that dry, uh, pure Douglas fir forest type and uh, mixed wood. This is essentially aspen and conifer forest and um, lodgepole pine, which is the predominant, um, predominant forest type. So if we look, this is what I'm showing you here on these graphics is just the median fire intervals that we've reconstructed over about the last 300 to 350 years in these ecosystems. Um, and what you can see is um, certainly a lot of variability in the Yellowstone ecosystems. Um, median fire intervals that are on the order of 50 or so uh, uh, years between fires, um, but quite a lot of variability. And one of the things that's really st stood out to us from uh, these Rocky Mountain front ecosystems is how frequent fires were, including in forest types that traditionally have been thought to have very frequent fire, like lodgepole pine, um, but also the low variability. So it was frequent fire, but it was consistently frequent, right? Which is a different story um, to what we were seeing in the Douglas fir forest in, in Yellowstone that had relatively frequent fire, but a lot of variability and a lot of vari variation around. Um, when we look at the severity of fires, which we were able to reconstruct using these methods, one of the things that you see here in these Douglas fir forests is that there's a, quite a mix of fires over time. Um, here you can see about uh, 40 to 60 percent of fires were high severity, so an important role for high severity fire, even in these ecosystems, but mixed in there with a lot of other um, low and moderate severity fires. And a similar pattern emerges for the Douglas fir forest types in southwestern Alberta. Um, but what the majority of the landscape that is dominated by these lodgepole pine forests, what we've seen is um, a, a really important component of high severity fire, which is consistent with a lot of the classical theory and informa empirical information we have about lodgepole pine. But we've seen some interesting behaviors here where um, low and moderate severity fires are also fairly prominent in the record, in about 30% of fire events. Um, and if we look at how these mix over time, um, what we see is that any given point on the landscape, any given patch on the landscape, for almost any of these forest types in both of these study regions, was highly variable over time. There wasn't a consistent norm, right? Some of the, most, every patch in this landscape, or about 80% of them, had experienced high severity fire at some point, and then many of those were reburned by non-stand replacing fires. So a real mix um, over time over much of this landscape and, and sort of a non-equilibrium dynamic for a lot of these landscapes. So I want to drill down after sort of presenting some of the basic ecology of these ecosystems that we've been finding into two important points. One is about resilience mechanisms in these mixed severity fire regimes. How are they resilient under this type of a fire regime? What are the mechanisms that allow them to be resilient? Oops, I wasn't supposed to pop up yet. Um, <coughs> What we see in the literature oftentimes is this idea that, um, especially systems that have been adapted to frequent fire, um, 
if they're affected by a high severity fire, then they might move from the state of uh, a, 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 a feedback of low severity fires um, that maintain it in that state into one where suddenly you get high severity fires. So you can take the case of, say, ponderosa pine that's been affected by fire exclusion that traditionally was ex experienced low severity fires were relatively frequent. And if you get a big high severity fire, suddenly you lose those fire resistant structures. You lose that history that was helping that stand to sort of survive future fires, right? And you may therefore get stuck in this high severity fire feedback, which is a very different dynamic. Um, and what we did to examine this with our data was to calculate what you see here on the on the y-axis, what we call the lethal non-lethal interval, which is just the time elapsed between uh, a high severity event followed by a non-high severity event. If that, if the next fire is a high severity, so if you if you have a if you have a high severity event and your next fire is not a high severity event, how much time elapsed between those two events? Um, and this is the distribution of those here, which you can see varies uh, a little bit depending on the, the study region and, and the ecosystem type, but generally it's between 30 to 70 years. So across most of this, these two different study landscapes, what we were finding is sites were impacted by high severity fire, but the next fire was not a high severity fire predominantly. It was oftentimes a low or moderate severity fire. And rather than getting stuck in that high severity fire feedback loop that, that people worry about, what we see is a lot of switching between these two states over time, a lot of variability. Um, and what we think is the mechanism, our data can't um, reveal this specifically, but what we think is happening is if you think about how an ecosystem responds to fire and what happens with time since fire, the shape of these curves between flammability or probability of burn or any number of different um, variables uh, can be represented in different ways, but generally it's a positive relationship. So that with greater time since fire, your flammability or your risk of fire increases. And what we think is happening in these landscapes is that they were burning when they were still in a low flammability state, right? These intervals that we show here, um, here I'll show you a here, this is actually a pretty good one. So this is a visual representation of what we're actually, um, what we think was happening in, in historical landscapes. And what I think the key to explaining this behavior is, and it essentially is heterogeneity in fuels in post-burn environments, especially post-high severity burn environments, um, and fire behaviors that we just don't fully understand yet because we haven't had that many opportunities to deal with reburns, uh, especially over these longer or intermediate time periods with time since fire up until very recently. Um, so this is a picture from the Lolo National Forest near Missoula, an area that burned at high severity in 1987. And I, the picture was taken 29 years later. So think about how, how you think fire behavior would unfold in that landscape. What would the severity patterns be? Would trees survive, or would it be another high severity fire? Right? There's a, there's a lot of heterogeneity, um, and maybe some different perspectives that we could discuss about this. Um, but traditional fire modeling looks at things like, um, well, what are the tree species and the ages that we have there? Do they have fire resistant traits yet? Um, you've got abundant fine fuels here, um, a lot of, of elemental exposure. And what I think is an important point to think about is um, that most of the fire modeling work that we've done, most of the fire modeling work that we've developed has been done in mature forests. I mean, up until the 2000s or so, this was the kind of environment that was in people's heads. It was the kind of environment that people were sampling and studying. Um, and there has been a lot less work to develop models that work and are calibrated for um, these newly burned landscapes. There's a lot, I think, that we don't know about how they may burn. Um, and some interesting work that really should be um, one of our next research, uh, research trajectories. Um, and then one more picture here. This is a local one. I think you gave me this one, Mike, yeah. if you remember. Yeah. Um, but this is an area that was burned in very, you, know, you can see the same landscape on the field trip that we're going to. Um, this is the North Fork of the Sun that was burned in the 1988 uh, fire year, and then again in the 2013 Red Shale Fire. So this is one that Mike pointed out specifically, right? Yep. Right um, and this is an area that burned at high severity fire. Burned at high severity fire, and you can see the reburning cake in some cases completely blew out others. This would be high severity fire followed by high severity fire. And you can see a lot of mosaic in there as well a lot of interesting fire behavior in at least portions of these fires. So the last point that I want to address is about fire-driven tipping points. And this really is about 
how do ecosystems respond to frequent fire. There is some work that was done that was very influential by Anthony Westerling and Monica Turner and others um, where they did some fire climbing modeling in Yellowstone and then used climate, well, GCM models um, to project this into the future and essentially um, project what might happen in Yellowstone as a result of climate driven forcing of wildfires. And um, some of their findings are, are quite striking. Right, they suggested that the Yellowstone, portions of Yellowstone may essentially collapse because they won't be able to sustain such high burn rates. Um, and it wouldn't even be that far into the future, right? As early as 2035, when you get into these um, 30 or 40 year fire return intervals below, this is where they predict the ecosystem collapse. But the thing that they're missing here and that they didn't address and that is fundamental to how these landscapes will respond to increased fire frequencies are the feedbacks, right? We know this is a fundamental um, ecological importance. This is an example of the importance of feedbacks from the boreal forest where they modeled burn areas a function of weather and land cover. And essentially what they found is that um, if you only include um, weather without land cover feedbacks, you basically get a model that performs as well as a null model. You really need those feedbacks included to be able to capture uh, the behavior of these ecosystems. So looking at lodgepole pine forest, which is the dominant um, vegetation in Yellowstone and also one that we've been studying in Alberta, if you look at how these, these ecosystems have been studied um, and what we found, you see lodgepole pine in mixed severity fire regimes where there's low fire intervals, uh, predominantly these dry mixed conifer forest types where they're mixed with other species. We wanted to kind of place this um, conversation in, in the context of the lit literature and what we expect from these different forest types. In most mixed conifer forest types, um, you begin to see a bit of a splitting. In some cases, there's still mixed severity fire effects. In some cases, there's these longer interval, um, high severity fire regimes. And if you look at a classic uh, lodgepole pine ecosystem, um, it tends to be in the literature represented by studies where there's long fire intervals and um, high severity fire effects. And what we've been finding in Alberta is a very different landscape. In some cases, we're still seeing high severity fire, but with much more frequent fire. And in fact, we're seeing a lot of these forests that were um, within mixed severity fire regime systems. And this is what this ecosystem looked like. This is a, a photograph in the 1940s, and this is some of the fire scar evidence that we found on lodgepole pine trees in this ecosystem. Trees that are being scarred multiple times at relatively short intervals when they were this size. So this is you know, the first 20, 30 years of its life, lodgepole pine uh, surviving fires. And this is fairly widespread within the study area. And you can see the really interesting mosaic um, that is created by these. Here is aspen that, has been, that was young and regenerated from a fire and has been reburned. These was actually two cohorts of aspen in sort of a savanna of surviving lodgepole pine there. And this is just a series of photos from that same, uh, from the same study area showing what this landscape looked like in 1913. Um, it's a really diverse landscape, a really interesting mosaic, and one that I think is reflected a little bit in some of these landscapes, like the Bob, where we're beginning to see wildfires um, burn again. I could show you lots of these, and there's lots more to see, actually. Um, here's one that shows the landscape in 1895, following two fires. Um, in intermediate fire frequencies, and here's the exact same landscape with that same hill uh, taken about 45 years later following a series of large fires, and you can see the huge uh, transformations in this landscape um, from predominantly conifer-dominated forest to one that's dominated by recovering conifer forest and um, deciduous forest, aspen forest. So the last point that I'll make is we actually have done some analyses <coughs> of data looking at how um, these ecosystems respond to changes in fire frequency. And I'll show you the results here. It's the most interesting. Um, and what we found, I'm going to show you in each of these graphics for the two uh, fire history variables are most important. It's the standard deviation of fire intervals and the median of those fire intervals is that as you increase, as you decrease your fire intervals and get more frequent fire, we see transitions from even age to more complex age groups. Um, we see fire severity decrease rather than increase, as we would expect from these high severity fire feedbacks. And we see the fire regime switch from 
a higher severity regime to more of a mixed severity regime. So this is actually a very um, different expectation than, for instance, what we put forward in that Western paper. And it's because we're looking at the feedbacks that occur in these landscapes when you get um, multiple reburns. 